It is actually a real pleasure to be here with you all and it is also very humbling because I'm talking about lifestyle medicine and I'm talking about global health and global service and those are two of the things that I really feel that I am standing on the shoulders of giants here at Lower Melinda and it is many of you and many of your colleagues over years and years of quiet work who have really been the founders in lifestyle medicine. Lowe Melinda has such, a, such an amazing track record of developing lifestyle medicine, of thinking about diet, of exercise, of resilience, of connectedness, of spirituality, and how that underpins all of our health, both as individuals, as communities and populations. And then on the other side, what better place to be able to speak to people about global service? So many, I'm sure of you, as well as of um, other people here throughout the Loma Linda community, so many people have given to underserved con um, communities, both here in San Bernardino and abroad as well. So I am definitely humbled to be speaking here, and I would like to make this actually a little bit more of an interactive session. I have more, I mean, I could easily speak for the whole time, but I'm really interested to hear people's opinions and have this as a conversation as well. So at the end, when we're talking about innovations, I'm going to invite anybody to, well, not even at the end, any time that you would like to bring up a point that you would like to ask a question, if you would like to hackle, please go ahead, because I think it's great having all of these diverse minds in the room to be able to really think and innovate together. Now, thank you very much, Dan, for the introduction. And um, it, I, I work um, with and for um, Dr. Dan Reichart, because he, as you know, is the head of our family medicine. And it's great to be working in family medicine as well as preventive health here. But before I even came to Loma Melinda, I um, was born and brought up in New Zealand. And I wanted to tell you about my Oma. So I adore my Oma. And Oma, as you know, is the Dutch or German word for grandmother. And she, um, she was truly an angel in the making. But there were some times that I was wary of her. And one of those things I was wary about was um, when she would invite me for afternoon tea on a Thursday afternoon. Now, any other afternoon tea, any time in the week would be fine. But Thursday afternoons, I knew, was when she would go grocery shopping. For her, that meant a 30-minute walk, going to her friends who owned the grocery store with local produce, going to the supermarket for dry goods, and then 30 to 40 minutes walk uphill. And a grandchild was the perfect person to come alongside and help carry some of the bags. So that was why I was cautious. But my grandmother, with her um, philosophy really, as Michael Pollan says, to eat real food, not too much, and mainly plants, to live in a faith-based um, community, to really live her beliefs, and to love, to love other people. Um, not to mention her sense of humor. Now, I have no evidence for this, but I really think that a sense of humor helped with her longevity as well. She lived through both world wars and well into her 90s. On the other side, my father and actually my uh, husband as well are from the majority world. Now they come from an area where it is really a miracle to live beyond the age of five, to survive diarrheal disease, to survive malaria, to survive being the ninth or the twelfth pregnancy um, in a series. And then also, so longevity is really a luxury. But now, in the last 10 years, everybody of our family who live in the majority world has, who has passed away has passed away from non-communicable disease. And we will talk more about this double burden now, that it is not only people who live in high-income countries who have the diseases of affluenza, but people in low-income countries as well. So I tell the story for three reasons. One, to highlight the difference between high and low income countries and non-communicable disease. Then secondarily also to highlight the importance of, of just our individual choices and that's really where lifestyle medicine comes in. And thirdly, to never underestimate the wisdom um, 
of grandparents because it's only now that I realise why Thursday afternoon was such an important time for my grandmother. So with that, this afternoon I'd like to really look at the, um, the global syndemic of non-communicable disease, of obesity in particular, but non-communicable disease broader. Now syndemic was a new term, I actually had to look it up when I was reading the Lancet article which came out last, the month before last. A syndemic is when two or more epidemics, and obesity is really a pandemic by itself, but when two or more epidemics work together and are mutually reinforcing to create an intertwined and greater problem. So we're going to go back to a syndemic of non-communicable disease then to describe some of the solutions that lifestyle medicine provides and to have fun looking at some of the examples of lifestyle medicine. Because there are so many dynamic and innovative people all around the world who have seen this huge enormity of this problem and who are um, really bringing so many solutions to them. I can see some of them at the back of the um, lecture hall and some scattered through as well who really are using lifestyle medicine with love throughout the world. So, to go through some of the depressing statistics at the beginning, when you think that we have 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth, 41 million people passed away from non-communicable disease in 2016, and 71%, so almost three quarters, almost four in five people died in low or middle income countries from non-communicable disease. So now this burden is unequally shifted to the people that can afford it the least. I'm oh, sorry, 71% died altogether and almost four and five, so the 85 is the low and middle income countries. If we go to the next, this is another way of highlighting similar as well, that the, the main thing from this one graph that I want you to pick up is that six of the seven greatest causes of death or most uh, numerically impactful causes of death in 2016, which is the last data that the World Health Organization has released, six out of the seven are non-communicable disease. I don't know if you can see, but it doesn't matter so much. It's ischemic heart disease, then chronic obstructory pulmonary disease, then lower respiratory infections, which um, as we know is often a terminal illness when you have other underlying conditions. Um, and then Alzheimer's, and I know that the Scherzeis spoke at this as well, which is again a really significant non-communicable disease. Another way of thinking of this is that within non-communicable diseases, almost half are cardiovascular, um, and tw just over 20% include cancers. And we also talk about the respiratory illnesses, which include COPD and asthma. And then on top of that, we have this extra... Um, area of diabetes. Now we know diabetes is often an underlying cause, but this is diabetes deaths independent of cardi secondary cardiovascular or end organ damage. This, I just want you to see the two colours, that in the high income country, non-communicable disease is by far the biggest killer. However, in low income countries, which you can see on the left, the red is infectious disease. So infectious disease is still huge. The cause of infant mortality, the cause of under five mortality is still predominantly infectious disease. And yet, 85% of non-communicable disease is in these same countries. So again, the double burden, another way of saying it, you can see the high income countries mainly have non-communicable disease, the low income countries have mainly, uh, the very low income countries still have this uh, high burden of infectious disease. As more wealth comes into the country, more and more of the diseases of affluence come with it, and this double burden, still with infectious disease and now with the cardiovascular cancer and respiratory disease associated with it. This is what we all hope to to think, to see, and that we think of when we think of the majority world. Happy people eating real food, probably made and, um, I should say, probably grown and then cooked by themselves or their family or their friends. And um, this was, you know, a wonderful picture of when we 
were in Jengri in um, Nigeria, a couple of years ago. Um, but unfortunately, this is also what there really is. That with this double burden, there is over caloric burden and yet under nutrition that there are more and more people struggling with obesity without the micronutrients which are needed for longevity, for health, and also for immunity. Now with obesity, and I apologize that um, we were going to have a hyperlink here to show the changes really from 1975 to 2016. But you can imagine that the world has gone, you could say, from blue to red. Here, only India is left where under 10% of the women, and this is women um, between 18 and 79, under 10% are not considered overweight or obese. That is the only area in a couple of other spots throughout Southeast Asia, including Japan. But in most of the places now, obesity is almost the norm. Here in the United States, we see the same demographic and seismic shift from 1990, where you can see all the blues, light blues to white, is under 15%. And this is not overweight or obesity, this is just obesity. So in 1990, less than 15% of all the states um, had people who had adults with a BMI less than 30, greater than 30, sorry. And then in 2000, uh, if you look down the bottom as well, you can see that it's more between the 15 to 20% or between the 20 to 24%, which is the yellows. But unfortunately now when we look at 2010, we don't have a 2020 yet, but several states have greater than 30% of their population with a BMI over 30, true obesity. With this, specifically in the United States, comes a huge economic burden. And if we think back and keep in the back of our minds this syndemic, so there is obesity, there is non-communicable disease, there is undernutrition as well as high calories, and there is this huge economic burden, then finally we're going to talk about planetary health as part of the syndemic. Um, but as you can see, the leading causes of disability-adjusted life years were all non-communicable diseases. And this was from a JAMA article just last year, but it's been purported again and again and again. This, again, is the syndemic, really looking at young people in so many places are struggling with obesity. Their parents have worked so hard for them to have all the options that they can, and yet the options which they are presented with or the options which are the tastiest are not the best, which are the best for their health. And I know that if anybody in the audience may be a parent, they may or may not have struggled a little bit with the tastiness which their kids love above and beyond the nutritional value of the food. The syndemic of obesity, undernutrition, not just malnutrition, but um, I would say not just malnutrition in the form of kwashiorkor or marasmus or protein deficiency malnutrition, but thinking of micronutrient poor, calorie rich malnutrition. And climate change. This is a new, I, I invite you to look at the Lancet Commission report which just came out last month, um, which is the first to have coined this concept of syndemic, although we've been talking about it for a while. This is from Margaret Chan, the Director General of the um, World Health Organization up until last year. And she, already back in 2017, talked about the connections, the economic connections as well, and I quote, the globalized marketing of unhealthy products opened wide the entry point for the rise of lifestyle-related chronic conditions. And this next part, which is pretty topical, this is a unique time in history where economic progress, improved living conditions, and greater purchasing power are actually increasing diseases rather than reducing them. There we come to planetary health, that we are so blessed to live on this planet where, which we are uh, visiting for a while or renting for a while, and yet our health depends on our environment. 
And we have done an incredibly good job at, at increasing our conveniences, at increasing our available calories, and at decimating the planet in the process. Here, um, the UN, Helen Clark, who is the head of the UN Development Project, all the way back in 2014, makes this economic link. Um, really saying that recognizing planetary health as critical to achieving sustainable development and healthy communities. The Economist, also back in 2014, the uh, United Nations Standing Committee on Nutrition. And I just want here to say it's critical to promote changes in dietary patterns towards less greenhouse gas intensive. If we think, keep that in mind, National Academy of Science, a little bit later, 2016, that the United States, we're now beginning to get traction in this idea as well. And if we look at it in a very simple way, what you eat tonight matters. If you have a surf and turf dinner, which is, uh, what is it called, lobster tail and um, filet mignon, then you, that combination produces over 800, over 800 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. Now, um, the United States produces over 5,000 tons. Um, so it's, we call it MMT, so it's, it's million metric equivalent tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. So annually, which is about 1.6 MMT per person per year. And the majority of that comes from agriculture and the transport industry. Well, we call it the energy industry, which includes mainly transport. But one dinner like that is equivalent in carbon greenhouse gas emissions to driving from Los Angeles to New York. Los Angeles to New York and the medium efficiency. We're not talking about a Tesla here. We're talking about like, you know, uh, a regular Toyota Corolla, uh, not a Prius either, but something that would probably get 20, um, 20 to 28 um, miles per gallon. Now this is really catching on and it's great because I know that I am in a way um, preaching to the choir here that most of you I'm sure have heard of lifestyle medicine, have heard of global health, have heard of the impact and the importance of what we eat. But I got a call from Greenpeace uh, a few months ago now, and initially after realizing it was not a telemarketer, I was really surprised that they were asking for us in the lifestyle medicine community to come on board for the first time an environmental advocacy group as large as Greenpeace for the first time was moving into nutrition. That is a simple message, eat less meat, more plants. And that the choices we make about our food they don't care so much about the health of humanity, but the health of the planet and are realizing. So I'm putting this in here as well because I know that it's all been doom and gloom so far, but there is cross-sectional fertilization. And the beauty of global lifestyle medicine is that there's the potential for innovation in all countries around the world and in all sectors, not just in health. We don't have to stay in our silo. In fact, we have to get out of our silo to find the answers here. Now, how did we get here? I love Wendell Berry, who's a farmer, he's an essayist, he's an activist. But if you look on the bottom left, there's the standard American diet, the SAD diet, where 1.3 acres of land produces enough food for one person for one year. On the right of that picture, you can see that a plant-based diet, and the definition of plant-based is not just vegetarian, it's not just vegan, it's not just paleo, it's not just Mediterranean. What it is, is that 90% of your calories come from whole food, plant-based, unprocessed food. So that's the definition of plant-based. In a plant-based diet, the same amount of land can feed 28 people compared to the standard American diet. How did we get here? quite beautifully put by Wendell Berry, people are fed by the food industry which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry which pays no attention to food. Except in Loma Linda, of course. <laughs> so that's um, really also just saying the importance of this cross-cultural uh, and cross-silo fertilization of ideas. 
Now the first WHO um, report, the very first one, which is pretty unbelievable on diabetes, really highlighted that governments and communities need to be able to empower people to make healthy choices. And health systems also need to be able to treat and diagnose people with this disorder. But this concept really that people are able to make healthy choices, easily said, very hard to do. I want to tell you a little story about um, Pakistan. So is it in, the, in December of last year, um, I had the privilege of being able to travel to Pakistan for the very first lifestyle medicine conference. And you, um, our own Dr. Hans Deal was there as well. In Pakistan, they're really going through that transition from an incredibly poor but plant-based diet to more and more affluence, the diseases of affluence, and associated with that more and more lifestyle-related um, diseases. 58% um, of adults are dying from non-communicable disease. Sorry, sorry, 58% of all people are dying from non-communicable disease. And then those other um, statistics from the WHO is premature deaths, which is adults, um, between the ages of 18 and 69. So this is a huge burden in Pakistan. Diabetes in Pakistan has gone from 5% in 1980 to, I have unpublished reports, but apparently it's now over 15%. Um, and is just rising incrementally but steadily, unfortunately. And we were able to talk to physicians, also able to talk to the Chamber of Commerce, which was really interesting. I thought that they would be interested in talking about lifestyle. But when you looked back at the DALIs, the disability adjusted life years, people were dying young and are not able to work because of these diseases. And then in the top right of those pictures, you can see Dr. Hans Deal talking to a liberal arts college, and they were great. And they really also brought it home. The fact that the questions they asked weren't, oh, am I going to live to, you know, whatever the, the average age is here, 120 before you pass away in Loma Linda or, or um, 100 and other places. But they were saying, how does this affect me now? And the truth is that it affects your reproductive capability. It affects your exercise tolerance. It affects the way that you enjoy life. It affects your mental health. And that are the things that they're concerned about. In this new Pakistan, the gentleman on the right was phenomenal. He was one of the main advocates now. And this really shows the ripple effect. Because over the last three and a half years, he's lost the equivalent of 100 pounds in weight um, through lifestyle medicine measures. And he also has now spread this to his family and then his community um, and then his university. And now there is a whole area where they come together and they actually exercise outside. They have all of this amazing um, plant-based food. And they also have this new relationship where they're talking to other people in other departments of the university, which they've never done. And then on the right, another family where um, it highlights, unfortunately, the sad side, that this is a well-to-do family in Pakistan, very, um, very kind and uh, very dedicated to their health, uh, to their work in healthcare, but for the first time, the father, there is no father in this family, he passed away at the age of 42 from a heart attack, the first evidence of non-communicable disease. And she actually was happy, Farah is the one on the far right, and she was happy for me to use that story. And she really said, this happened to us. We thought that everything from the West was good. And now we know that there is so much bad that we need to be selective. That is the power of global lifestyle medicine. Unfortunately, the new Pakistan also, and I will quote from the middle picture here, donut, the cure for the common breakfast. <laughs> and also written in Urdu. They've gone and really embraced so much of the bad things about affluence as well as the good things. Now, I put this up as well because we're talking a lot about diet, we're talking about exercise. We forget the impact of pollution. This is Lahore when we saw it. 
It has, um, it's one of the most, six most polluted cities on earth. And a lot of that is because like here in our own San Bernardino area, we have, they have, I don't know if we can compare the uh, San Bernardinos to the Himalayas, but we have the mountain range of the San Bernardino mountains, they have the Himalayas, it traps the smog. And they have the habit of crop burning as well. So they not only have um, dietary impact and affluence impact, they also have this crop burning and a respiratory impact, all to non-communicable disease. So why are we talking about lifestyle medicine as part of the solution? Well, certainly it is not alone the solution. It's working with other public health and with other different um, modalities to really look at it. But here we are in a medical institution, and lifestyle medicine has to become the first treatment option. It has to become the first treatment option to create a sustainable world and to tip over into a reduction, the beginning of a reduction in non-communicable disease. I'm sure many of you know Dr. Dysinger. I know last year Dr. Dysinger Sr. was able to be here at APC. Um, this is from the son, Dr. Wayne Dysinger, who said, lifestyle medicine is an evolving approach to patient care that focuses on comprehensive, evidence-based health assessment and natural treatment. Evidence-based assessment and treatment. He said it beautifully, but he wasn't the first to have said it. Two, um, 400 years before Christ, Hippocrates also said, as I'm sure you all know here in Loma Linda, let food be thy medicine and medicine thy food. Pillars of lifestyle medicine, I'm going to jump over. Nutrition, exercise, tobacco and alcohol control, stress management, sleep and healthy relationships. Now, are there any questions about any of this? Who had not heard of lifestyle medicine before today? Who coined the term lifestyle medicine? Do you know that it was right here in Loma Linda that the first term lifestyle medicine came into common use? So although these are updates and I'm painting the picture of the, the global burden, it really is you who have been the innovators in much of this. And now there's evidence in cancer, there's evidence in cardiovascular, cancer from Dean Ornish, cardiovascular disease from Dr. Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic, also the China study, of course, from Dr. Um, T. Colin Campbell, stroke, and I am not sure if you were able to listen to the um, reversal of Alzheimer's with the Shirzai team today as well, diabetes, cognitive function, um, erectile dysfunction, all of these, all of these come under what we talk about with lifestyle medicine. Now for the global part and the stories part. Before I say any questions, any questions on what we've talked about so far? No? Please don't hesitate to stop me because I really think that you have probably more interesting things that, to say than I have. Not at all biased by the fact that I know what I'm about to say. <laughs> but the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance came from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine more and more people came to us in the American College and said, I'm trying to set up something in Korea. I'm trying to set up something in Germany. We know we need lifestyle medicine, but how do we do it? And so three years ago, um, um, I was asked to start a global branch to the American College. That has now grown into 42 countries involved, um, all with physician organizations significant numbers of physicians from Lithuania to Brazil to Russia to Poland working within lifestyle medicine. And these are the pillars really of lifestyle medicine. These are our, the ones who've reached full sister organization status, which takes quite a bit of organizing and input from their part. They need to have a very good national functioning group. Um, and about it, really our aim is a world without non-communicable non disease, full stop. To do this, we have four pillars. So we're looking really at research, at network weaving, so that you know other physicians who are in another country but are trying to do the same thing as you. Certification, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and then also education. Now I see some people here who I know are phenomenal educators and who also know a lot about lifestyle medicine. So I would love you guys to... Um, 
to pitch in as well. I'm not going to highlight a lot about North America because I know that you know already a lot of what's going on here. We have the American College of Lifestyle Medicine with their um, conference, the next one's coming up in October in Orlando. Um, then we have our very own International Cong um, Congress on Vegetarian Nutrition right here in Lower Melinda. Sure, I don't need to talk more about that, but it has had a huge impact, a huge impact. And I just came from precepting the residents this morning. A lot of people in San Bernardino, which is, is it five miles, eight miles down the road, have never heard of the concept that, that I was going to say we, but that you've been talking about for generations here in Lower Melinda. So getting lifestyle medicine to low income populations, both here and abroad, is the next and incredibly important step. John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, I did um, some work um, with them as a, uh, post, as a post uh, master's work, and that was really looking at leverage points for health within the American agricultural system, looking at food policy networks and other people doing the same work. But Canada, is who I wanted to talk about. Does anybody know what the newest Canadian guidelines... Aha! Uh -huh. Tell me what they say. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for saying that. And also thank you to Canadians everywhere because really that is cutting edge. And here in the United States, we have not been able to get it through um, the American equivalent, I suppose, which is the um, which develops the gui dietary guidelines, which are very influenced by uh, agriculture. Then in South America. Um, a story I wanted to highlight top right here, um, well, I guess you could say middle right, there's a little group of students that you can see. These students, and I want to really highlight, if you speak to any student here in Loma Linda, that is probably one of the most meaningful things that you can do while you're here. Because the students are the ones really changing things. They are the ones who had the initiative and they are going to remote villages in Brazil and simply saying, tell us what you ate 20 years ago. Tell us the beauty of that. Tell us the changes since then. And coming from that, if we could, we're going to tee up a little video. Now, I, it's hard because it seems like we are blaming Nestle in this video. But really what it has more than anything is looking at the dynamics and the power difficulties in getting a nutritious diet to so many people worldwide. That's the one. Thank you. Depende do rio. Vida tranquila. Você come coisa fresca. Tanto faz ser açaí, a verdura, o camarão, o peixe. Agora não, mudou muito. Não mudou? Ultra-processed foods, soft drinks, salty and sweet snacks, and a lot of ready meals are actually not foods, they are formulations. I'm a big believer in what we do at Nestle, where we use science and then technology to enhance nature, not to replace nature. We are in this almost utopian period where food's abundant, it's cheap. We solved the problem of food security, but in doing that, we didn't anticipate what the impact would be. Now we focus on things like reducing salt and reducing saturated fat. In epidemiology, we see the vector of a disease. So uh, mosquitoes are the vector of uh, malaria. The vector of obesity is ultra-processed foods. Obesity is increasing. 
all over the world. In Brazil, every year we have one million new cases of obesity. When you see marketing in the US, it's trying to change people from brands. In Brazil, it's to make people change from traditional diets to ultra-processed foods. What Nestle and other companies are doing is they go to these small villages to get these new clients. As consumers climb up the economic ladder, they get to a point where their lifestyles change. We provide a very good choice for them. It's all about taste at the end, um, but not taste at any cost. We know that if we don't make a product that tastes good, it doesn't matter how nutritional or how good for you it is. If it's not being consumed, it's not having an impact on the diet. The success of these big food corporations will be the destruction of dietary diversity. Os produtos da Nestlé são mais gostoso, tem mais nutrientes, né, vitaminas. É bom. Se tivesse condições, né, a gente comprava para todo mundo tomar da Nestlé. We are in a transition in Brazil. When the transition is over, it will be much more difficult to go back. So, we are in a transition in Brazil. And we are in a transition in the majority world. That transition provides a huge potential for illness, a huge potential for non-communicable disease, but it provides a huge opportunity. And ladies and gentlemen, it is you, it is you who has the power to capitalize on that change, on that opportunity, really looking at wherever you have connections, whether it is Southeast Asia, whether it is San Bernardino, whether it is South America, that what we do, each one of us, has the power to really influence our own diet, our family's diet, the way that we live, and ultimately the diet of the, the planet. When I say diet, I'm focusing specifically on nutrition because that's an easy, tangible one. We could talk just as much about sleep, we could talk about um, exercise, but in the interest of time, to say in Africa, this is a huge thing. And the big push with the students in Brazil and now with students in several um, universities in Nigeria, in Mozambique, in Malawi, and in um, South Africa, students are saying, we love the traditional diet. Teach us so that it is not getting lost. In Australasia, this concept of planetary health is really important. The next, um, we're going to speak in June in New Zealand um, to really highlight not only the power of um, synergy between sectors, but also how planetary health is completely interwoven with our health, and we cannot stand as a silo in healthcare anymore. In Asia, in Seoul and Korea, and in, in, uh, next month is the next conference there, in the Philippines, in India, in Laos, in mentioned Korea, let me think where else, that is the, oh, in Japan, and now in China, of course, as well, with the huge population and the huge transition which is going on there. This is where lifestyle medicine is needed more than anywhere else. There are small pockets of physicians and of healthcare providers who are binding together, coming together, re sharing resources. Specifically in Asia, one of the big things is they have united as a group. So now we have the Asian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which has great influence as well as the country levels. In Europe, they have a lot to offer and they also have this uh, opportunity really where there is legislation similar to Canada and Scandinavia 
to look at the differences. However, there have been places like Finland where 15 years ago they almost eradicated heart disease in an area and now it's beginning to creep back again. In Israel in the Middle East, in Israel Next Generation University, you can look at it online, created by Stanford, and they um, now have a free online lifestyle medicine curriculum. Here in the United States, we also have a huge number of resources for teaching, for practicing, for what you can tell your patients, for what you can tell your neighbors, for what you can tell yourself when it comes to lifestyle medicine. And in the Middle East, where the burden is huge, where one in two um, dialysis patients as well as almost three quarters of the population suffer from lifestyle medicine related um, diseases. It has come to the notice of the World Health Organization as well and they have asked us as the lifestyle medicine community now to um, talk with them and it was um, in November that um, I was in Geneva and asked to speak in front of the global coordination mechanism at the World Health Organization. And I want to thank you because they now have recognized this amazing leverage point in the doctor-patient relationship and that we can talk about public health campaigns but if we don't have that personal approach to lifestyle medicine, not, not much is happening. This is the knowledge action portal in, um, in the interest of time we're not going to go into it but this is an online connection platform instigated by the World Health specifically on non-communicable diseases. You can get certified in lifestyle medicine. I can see a couple of people who are in the process of certification and five physicians here in Loma Linda have already certified as a board, become board certified in lifestyle medicine. And now as well in the medical, not only do we have healthy meals in the medical center, um, but there is a lifestyle medicine uh, concentration and a lifestyle medicine fellowship because we get an average of 12 hours of nutrition training in medical school. There's also the global service concentration and here in Loma Linda we have this perfect storm of opportunity to cross pollinate. So if anything I really want to ask you to think about a different paradigm. Think about the transition that so many countries are going through. Think about what you know and how it can benefit other people, whether it be in San Bernardino or other cultures all over the world. Thank you. So are, do we have any questions for Dr. Zinwa? Yes, Question please. over here. Certainly, so 90% of calories should come from whole food, plant-based sources. And there was another question there. Oh, great, thanks. Could you make uh, comparisons or distinctions between lifestyle medicine and complementary medicine? Yes. I've been to several of the health and nutrition conferences um, at the University of Arizona, Dr. Andrew Wild's organization, and they talk about all the same things that you're talking about. Are yes. we competing th with them? Are we cooperating with them? Certainly cooperating, but very different because lifestyle medicine is really within the house of medicine. It's the evidence-based um, component of medicine. So there is functional medicine, there is um, alternative medicine, complementary medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, all of these other ones. But we really say, where is the medical evidence, the weight of medical evidence in the, in the literature? And so the little part of that that is truly evidence-based is what we call lifestyle medicine. Does that answer a little bit the question? Not to say the weight of evidence can't change, but um, we really try and remain within an evidence-based framework. Yeah. Question here. I'm curious about the integration of lifestyle medicine teaching and practice and education here in Loma Linda. Walking around the campus, I see health pr uh, promotions building, and I think you're with the uh, family practice yes. program and also the School of Public Health. Yes. Uh, are these all integrated? 
Um, so I don't think seamlessly integrated, but we certainly try and work together as much as possible. We have lifestyle medicine practitioners, specialists who work within, and it was initially family medicine and now the Centre for Health Promotion. The ideal is that every practitioner here in, life, in Loma Linda become a lifestyle medicine practitioner. Right, Laurie? <laughs> but I do think that um, there are, so I was just speaking with Dr. Fraser from the Adventist Health Study. So there is that component of research and building the evidence there. The Centre for Health Promotion um, is one area where lifestyle medicine has been touted for a long time, as well as other forms of um, medicine. Then there is population medicine, and I suppose I love to bridge those two. So um, preventive medicine is looking at population-based healthcare, and then within family medicine there's also leveraging that clinical opportunity that you have with the doctor-patient relationship for individual. And um, lifestyle medicine speaks specifically to the clinical component of population-based medicine. Super complicated, but hopefully the idea is we're all working together. Question over there. Oh, yes, yes. and then we'll come back. Um, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how is this being taught to the students? Uh, what, how much of this is being shown or at least emphasized? Or if, we, if we're trying to get the doctors uh, currently to practice, uh, what, how is this being taught to the students? Yes, so thank you for that question. And um, Dr. April Wilson would be the best to answer that. There is more and more lifestyle medicine which is being integrated into the um, medical school curriculum. It is still not as much as we would like, <laughs> but it is over um, step by step. The hard thing is that medical school needs to be taught so they pass the USMLEs, um, the United States Medical Licensing Examinations. So we actually need to get more and more lifestyle questions in there. At the moment there's two to three lifestyle related, non-communicable disease related questions. If we have more questions at the end, there's more impetus for um, increasing the curriculum. The health of our patients would benefit hugely. So yes, we're on the way, but we're not there yet. Just a comment, I had been the one who mentioned the Canada Food Guide. I'm a nurse, actually. My father is a physician and graduate of Loma Linda. Um, but my parents have been, also have their master's in public health from Loma Linda, have been teaching uh, health education, lifestyle medicine in Victoria for 40 plus years. And I joined in with that about four years ago. So we're in public schools, we're in the federal prison, um, and we're in the community meeting. And we are the first NGO to uh, uh, form a nonprofit and partner with the uh, Health Authority of Vancouver Island to reach the 27,000 doctors, nurses, and employees. Wow. And so we're hoping to make an impact island-wide on the community there. Interesting statistic, 40% of British Columbians under the age of 35 are either vegan or vegetarian. Um, leading the population of Canada is British Columbia. Phenomenal. Well, thank you. Thank you for your quiet service as well. Can I invite everybody to thank you? And thank you um, for coming, number one, I, you're a familiar face, thank you for coming back another year later. And thank you also, that just highlights how this wouldn't be coming together as a global movement if it wasn't for both of you and if it wasn't for so many of you creating that ripple effect in so many places. So thank you. I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants. Dr. Sakala has a question. Yes. I'm wondering about in developing countries as people progress up the socioeconomic ladder, they want to appear doing the things that people who have money will do. And when a traditional lifestyle, which is more plain food, is viewed as associated with lower socioeconomic status, and a Western diet is more affluent, how do you address that within that culture? Yes. So it's a phenomenal, really important question, and I think that, that answering that question is answering the problem of global lifestyle medicine. So thank you for posing that. The answer, there's not one blanket answer. But I think the cross-pollination of things, for instance, in Brazil, it was the students who recognized the importance of that transition and now going to remote villages and saying, we actually really honor what you're doing. Let us write down your stories, write down your recipes and bring them back because urbanization is a big part as well. 
that is different to the way that it looked in um, Pakistan, where it was more about um, changing how the, what was cool and what was not in an urban setting. Um, and, but they are talking to each other. We have now students in Poland talking to people in Pakistan, talking to people in Brazil, to find what works specifically for their community. So thank you um, for that question. There's not one blanket answer, but that what we call bi-directional innovation, I really believe will bring um, so much of the, the answers to the question. Yes. I, I'd just like to say in response to that that we've been going to the South Pacific for years. I went there for my elective my senior year. I graduated in 1966. We've gone back almost every year since to do complicated surgeries. And in, in addition to this, we've also witnessed on lifestyle medicine and the importance of it. And I noticed as we were going back recently, we were seeing lots and lots of diabetes cancers, high blood pressure, heart attacks, which we never, you never used to see any of that. Yes. And so I just frankly told them, you know, they like to do what we do, and I just wanted to, wanted to let them know I see that they're starting to eat meat and not walk and take rides instead. Yes. And, and they used to always eat out of their gardens. Yes. And I said, I remember when we didn't see any of these kind of diseases. Do any of you remember when we, you didn't have those diseases? And they raised their hands. And I said, this is what's causing you to have these diseases now. So you better go right back to the way you used to live, of walking everywhere and eating out of your gardens. Phenomenal. And, and Thank they took you. it. And when we, were, when we were back there just a couple of years ago, they brought some food over for us, and they did, hadn't even put fish in the food, which they used to eat lots of fish. <laughs> and as salted fish, they were starting to get high blood pressure. Right. And so I, it made me very happy to see that they had remember, remembered those things from years past. Fantastic. Was that Fiji where you were? That was New Guinea. New Guinea, phenomenal. Now, I really want to be respectful for our next speaker as well, so I will ask if we can continue any questions just here as he's setting up. But I wanted to say as a last thing, in Fiji and the Solomon Islands, and um, with the 10,000 Toes Project and some other people, are all coming together. What we need is to show there is no country, Canada's coming close, Lithuania is coming close, Fiji has the potential to actually turn the tide of non-communicable disease. So we're focusing on different populations. If we can prove that a whole nation can change the way that they eat, change the way they exercise, change the way they sleep, change the, and reverse non-communicable disease, then the policy makers at an international level, that is what the World Health Organization said, just please, we need the data at a national level. So everything that you're doing, we need to bring it to a national level to really have the evidence that non-communicable disease can be reversed. I just have a quick question. Uh, are, are your, is your data corrected for, um, for age and, and for medical treatment? In other words, uh, I've understood that diabetes is increasing, and a lot of that is due to the kind of diet. But it's also true that because we have insulin, we're keeping diabetics alive, mm -hmm. so they live to reproduce. Uh, and so we have more diabetics uh, as well. Uh, and similarly, if people live longer because they're getting antibiotics, they live long enough to develop some of the diseases of older age. So I'm just asking a question you correct for that when you give the statistics. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Orr. It's really important. So the statistics are corrected for that. The, um, they're also corrected um, when we talk about um, premature mortality is corrected um, by age and demographic as well. And when we talk about disability adjusted life years, it's probably the, the biggest, shows the biggest impact um, from that component. Now the fact that people are living longer is not adjusted for the medica new medications we have. And that's worldwide that we don't, that I don't know of any way that we can factor that in. But everything else is, is corrected for, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. So what you're saying is if you don't die of, from infectious disease and you live longer, unfortunately infectious disease is still the biggest in the low income countries, but that, that demographic change to the middle income countries, that is where we're seeing it more than anywhere else. So 
So thank you all again. Oh, yeah. One more question. Okay, very nice. Uh, along the same line, how do you non-confound immunizations? Sorry, no. Immunizations. Along the same line, how do you factor immunizations in populations and non-infectious disease deaths? Yes. So that is, a, that is actually a question that I asked um, Dr. D.A. Henderson. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of him. He, is the, he was the man sort of purported with the, for the eradication of smallpox, and he was one of our mentors at, at Johns Hopkins. And I said, you know, how are we ever going to know the impact um, of immunizations? Because now they're so ubiquitous. And, and so there are some very complicated algorithms to try and unfactor immunizations, but in general, it is not factored in, it's just the new norm. Um, in saying that, New Zealand has 18 less immunizations um, in the childhood immunization schedule than, than the United States, less doses, I should say, and um, there is no significant difference in the burden of non-communicable disease. So, very complicated, I don't have a good answer to that. Thank you very much, Dr. Azinwa, <laughs> for your service and dedication to lifestyle medicine and global health. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you all.